I have all these photos of him on my wall in my office, you know, because I need to see them. I need to see them every day because I can easily forget, you know, I don't have roots in me, you know, I, it's kind of like I have to impose roots from the outside. So I have to visually remind myself, oh yeah, I have roots. I look like people. Who am I? 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 This is Who Am I Really? A podcast about adoptees that have located and connected with their biological family members. I'm Damon Davis, and today you're going to meet Mike, who called me from Berlin, Germany. Mike was born in St. Louis, Missouri, a place he ultimately fought hard to try to get away from because of its association with his adoptive family. After years traveling the country, then moving abroad to Germany, Mike found himself in reunion with his birth mother back in St. Louis. Mike says that out of everyone, he looks the most like the one person he really wanted to find, and that these days he's turning some challenging experiences in his life into positivity for others. This is Mike's journey. Mike is originally from St. Louis, Missouri. He was born in the summer of 1967. He characterized their family as clinging on to the middle class. A few years after his adoption, his younger sister was adopted, which had an effect on him in an already challenging house to grow up in. It was a little disorienting, I have to say. This is a tricky thing with this, with me. It's all, and in a way, listening to a lot of podcasts and interviews helps me is I realize that adoption is just disorienting. You know, I did feel a lot of disorientation. It was, it was a rough house. It was a, there was a lot of mental illness. And so I've always kind of blamed, you know, I've always had this stuck in quicksand feeling. I mean, I've pushed through and I'm, I'm a little surprised I've done some things based on this history. But I realize in retrospect and more and more that a lot of it has to do with, you know, separation from, from mother, from heritage. But growing up, I don't remember like being teased or anything about being adopted. I think it was open. We were told at a very young age that we were adopted. I can't, you know, I can't say it was told in such a nice way. It seemed a very controlling way. It was sort of like, you know, other people had to choose their children and we, other, other people had to have their children and we chose you. And so it seemed, I always remember looking at them, kind of thinking, what is this about? Why are you telling this? And it felt very controlling, like, don't act up or you're going back. I don't know, something like that. And that was always a feeling I had anyway, like, don't act up, be cool. Let's get through this. Can you give an example of what, why you felt that don't act up kind of signal? I know you've said that it wasn't explicit, but do you remember a situation where you just kind of felt like, yeah, I probably shouldn't rock the boat here? I don't know. I mean, I, I had a very strong feeling. I mean, it was very violent what I had to grow up in. I mean, day and night, you know, like we would get woken up for to get pummeled, you know, so I don't know, but somehow I felt that, you know what, as bad as this is, it's worse where I came from. I guess we were, t there was, it was either explicitly, yeah, it, it, somehow I got that feeling. You know, my sister and I never talked about it, how bad things were. And I don't know if we knew how bad things were. I just thought this is how life is, you know, mm -hmm. you have to brace yourself. And I kind of, when I finally got away from them, you know, I, I took those lessons into life and they did not serve me for a long time that the way to succeed is to be hiding in as small and as quiet as possible. I thought, well, this is how you succeed, succeed in life. And then I'd see people big and boisterous having success. I thought, I don't get it. You know, I just couldn't put it together. My adopted mother, would, she would rage, you know, and she would stop around 
screaming, we ought to send these kids back, you know? So I think it was, it was there and it was not infrequent to hear that. You heard it often. Right. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. A lot of things we heard often. And she was not happy to adopt. I mean, that was quite clear. You know, she would scream at him that he was sterile, you know, and the implication was she had to adopt. So you always felt like you're on eggshells, you know, but I had a feeling, I did have a feeling I got to play it cool and just graduate, get the hell out of here. Otherwise they're going to send me, I'm going to end up in a mental institution and they're going to do, what is it called when they, they electroshock your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had that at a very, a very strong feeling, but you know, uh, that was my feeling. I just, I, I learned to, to be cool, almost immobile. I do a lot of physical stuff now to learn how to be physical again. I do kickboxing and Zumba, you know, all this stuff. And I never talked to my adopted sister about this, you know, we were just, everybody was on their own. Oh, that's really interesting. So your adoptive mother is pretty overt about her disappointment in having, having to adopt. And she doesn't let yeah, but, your, yes. your father sort of forget it. So that's stress between them, and it's about you guys. And then you're also being abused day and night as a reminder and an outlet for her, it sounds like, against well, you guys. I'm people. telling you, that's a tough one. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the tough reality that I, I had been in denial about for a long time was that, and it's the reason why I did not have kids because the, the message was kids will crush you. Kids are a crushing burden. Uh, yeah, hmm. that's, that's the reality of it. And she would overtly complain about our expenses, you know, how expensive we were. And he was very passive and we would turn to him to help us. And he did nothing. He would look at us angrily as, as if, why are you causing her to act this way? And I thought, wow, you know, at some point I gave up, you know, I gave up on them. I gave up on, I hate to say it, a kid giving up on life, but I, I was in a really dark place for a long, long time. Mm. Wow. And I, I decided at a young age, I'm like, I'm getting out of here, man. I don't know how I'm getting out of here. As soon as I can, I am getting out of here and I'm never looking back. And I can't say I stuck to that because I, nonetheless, I tried to connect with him for decades after leaving home. And finally, and especially after finding my birth family, you know, what I consider my real family, uh, all of that need to connect with uh, the adoptive family has just dissipated, you know. I can't fix their, it was always our role was to fix their relationship problems. And I realized, you know, I can't make them happy. You know, they have to do some of the work. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm doing therapy, 12 stuff. They could do something, you know. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Did the situation of being both adoptees and I assume both being abused by your adoptive mother, did that in any way bond you together? Did you sort of seek comfort and support for, for and from each other? Here's what I remember. I remember every Sunday that there was a huge blowout fight and my, usually in the kitchen and there would be dishes being thrown and screaming and the tension to build during the day. And then at around five o'clock it would explode. My sister and I would, this is when I remember us bonding. And I don't remember much else. We would come in my room and kind of hug each other and just shake and say, please get a divorce. Please get a divorce. That is what I remember us coming together about. I don't think we knew it was unusual to be treated this way. You know, we imbibed the message that we're a problem. We tried to change. And so what was it to talk about? You know, I hope that made sense. No, it absolutely did. It did make sense because. What you said was we didn't know that this was abnormal. And I often yeah. think about this with adoptees who are in similar situations to the one that you grew up in is 
if you've only had one home, then you assume that what you're growing up in is normal until you start to get exposed to what other homes are like and and you're able to think for yourself, wait, this is this is kind of jacked up over here, right? This is really crazy. You know what I mean? And so it's it's yeah. because there's no comparative basis upon which to reflect on your own experience to say this is no good and you know for lack of better words these people are crazy right and 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 that's a really yeah. tough place for a child because then it does all come back on you as the child you are the problem you are the reason that things are wrong or what have you so I, I admit what you said made sense for sure. I mean, I just knew I had to change, you know, I was causing them to do this to me. So I will get smaller. I will get quieter. I will stop moving so much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even uh, getting very immobile. I became a huge reader, you know, it expand. Uh, it has led to me expanding my mind, but there was, you know, a loss. Yeah. Can you tell me, you used the words stuck in quicksand as a feeling that you had. Can you describe to me what that means? What do you mean by stuck in quicksand as, as a kid in adoption? Yeah, I know the feeling. And can I describe it? I've had successes, you know, creative successes. And I've had people tell me I'm very talented. And I've had, and I've had successes. But I've never felt, in retrospect, I see I've never had a basis to launch from. And that's tricky to say because then it sounds like self-pity. You know, well, and it's like, well, you didn't want it enough or something like that. You know, but I did want it enough and I did work really hard and I did have successes. And then it's like, uh, you know, I didn't reconnect with my birth mother until about six years ago, you know, and so since then, that feeling of quicksand has all but dissipated. It still comes up every once in a while. So I know the feeling of, oh, that feeling's not there anymore, you know, mm -hmm. and when I have a success now, I can follow up and I'm not, I don't have to wake up and wonder who my dad is anymore. You know, all these distractions when people as kids or teenagers, they're figuring out what they want to do. They whatever, they're doing internships, you know, all we were trying to figure out is what does this crazy lady want? How can we calm her down? Who is my mother? I'm wondering this every day, every day waking up, who are, what are their names? Who are they? You know, mm -hmm. distraction. And the feeling of quicksand is just like having no basis. Like I heard an interview with a, a composer and he's from Munich, big name composer. And he, he talked about how he's taking his kids from L.A. and they're all moving back to Munich because he wants the kids to have a strong basis. And he uses he used these words. He said, and this is where I get my power from. Having these roots, having this strong basis. And I felt, oh, my God, that's it. You know, I did not have that. And it's very hard to create that through, I find, through meditation, through yoga, through whatever. And I did all those things. And I was on a spiritual path all over the place. You know, you're a classic seeker. But then when I found both of my parents, you know, everything solidified. I felt it physically, like I'm not a ghost anymore. You know, and I can actually be in the world. I can actually be in this world and take up space. Mike was counting down the days to graduating high school and getting out of his house. He said he was so elated to have reached that milestone that he doesn't even remember if his parents were at his graduation. He thinks they went, but he's not sure. For Mike's college graduation, his adoptive mother did not go. She said she was sick, which was one of her themes, getting attention through illness. Mike said he felt fine about it. He didn't really want her to go anyway. He wanted to get the heck out of St. Louis because he attached that city to his family. After considering a one-way ticket to Mexico or joining the Merchant Marines, Mike ended up at a private college elsewhere in Missouri, then a public school, and he bounced from major to major in his course of study. 
Bouncing around more, he moved from city to city, from New Orleans to New York, to Chicago, and then back to New York. Mike did some writing, stand-up comedy, acting, and painting and remodeling, work which he really had a knack for. And I was written up in three different best-of magazines, in their yearly best-of lists. And it turns out my dad was a tile layer. Let me ask, you know, the... I was thinking about you, this young guy out on the road, and you're trying to find career success with a foundation of quicksand. You've, you've gained independence, but you don't have the core foundation that a lot of children get when they have a solid upbringing at home. And, you know, a lot of times when you're out on the road and you're trying to find your career and make your way, you know, there's the sort of every couple of days call home to mom or every couple of days they call you and or dad checks in. And, and I would imagine you didn't get that. Is that true? And, and what was it like to just just be out there w in a way that it sounds like you were alone? Is that true? And what was it like? I do remember every once in a while, I had this tremendous guilt, despite how bad things were, that I'm leaving them. You know, we're supposed to be there for them and I'm leaving them. I do remember when I left for New Orleans, I actually left on a Christmas day. I realized on retrospect, it was, it was like a statement. And I remember them crying and kind of grasping at me and I'd say, I'll visit soon. And uh, literally having to pull myself out of their grasp. I just felt like if I stay here, I am gonna die, I'm gonna suffocate. And I just got in my car and I drove. And did they call me? I don't know. I can't say I remember. I, but like I say, I was full of guilt. So I would call in. I would call to check in and I would send sometimes flowers for Mother's Day with a really nice card. You know, I guess it's that adoptee thing. It's like, okay, they weren't great, but they're all I've got. So until I figure something else out, you know, let's not totally cut them loose. Around 18 years old, Mike told his adoptive parents he wanted to search for his birth parents. His desires were met with tears from his adoptive parents who couldn't understand why he wanted to search. They would call their families every day, but they couldn't understand why Mike wanted to know who his people were. Their tears stopped his search for 10 years. In New York, Mike attended an adoptee search and reunion group. Joe Saul. Very helpful guy, ran the group, adoptee, and he gave me the name of the contact in the Midwest, Virginia, amazing woman. I contacted her, and within two days, she had the name of my mother. Wow. That must have been crazy, because when those things happen fast like that, you don't really have time to process. What was that like? You know, incredible. Unbelievable. It's like, <laughs> how do you... I, I, I will say this to you. I've never been a big alcohol and drug guy, but I, I've always been kind of, a lot of adoptees have this kind of girl crazy. So I was not the most sober guy back then. So I would say I was not totally present. So what did I feel? I felt, oh, that's great. That's great news. You know, now I know. But I was so unsober in my life. I can't say I felt any kind of full solidifying like I felt when I found my dad. And it turns out even back then I wanted to find my dad more than my mom. You know, I realized as soon as I found her, it's like, well, I really want to find him. And I think a lot of it is because our adopted dad did not protect us, you know, and I think I've been looking for that, that strong paternal figure. The absence of a father figure in his life left Mike craving that kind of person on his search. He was always looking for mentors, intellectual challengers, and people who could fill that void along the way. So, Mike's private detective, Virginia, found his birth mother. She spoke to his birth mother first. Then later, Mike called to speak with his birth mother for the first time. The woman was living at home with her mother, Mike's maternal grandmother, when she was found. When I talked to her, after about 10 minutes, her mom yelled, that's long enough. Hang up. And my mom was very dutiful, you know, she hung up. She said, well, let's, let's save some. She always said, let's save some. And so I'm in New York and I had this idea, you know what? 
If I ask her to meet me, she's going to ask her mom. Her mom's going to say no. Again, I'm, I'm not in my full sanity when I'm thinking this. But So I go to St. Louis. I meet with Virginia, the detective. We drive down to meet my mom. Showing up blind, I'm acting like a delivery man. And, you know, any reason to knock on the door. And I've got like a clipboard and I've got a Christmas card on it. And and I knock. We find the house in the city. I go up the stairs. It's an old city building. I knock or, or I ring. I forget. Somebody comes down the stairs. It's a woman in her 50s. She can't stop staring at me. She ends up telling me later I look exactly like my dad looked at that age. Wow. And so much of this is foggy. You know, I was a little nuts. You know, I didn't take a photo. I just had her sign it and we kind of looked at each other. It's a little, uh, a little crazy. Virginia's in the car looking up at us smiling and, and that was it. She went back and I, and then I called her a few times after that, but it was always the same with her mom. I think I called her three times and her mom would always say that's long enough. Hang up. Her mom had no interest in meeting me. Her mom is the one who made her give me up right. to Catholic charities, you know, and she knew when I called again, she talked about how I looked just like him. And, you know, when I asked her about it, I, I didn't have any questions prepared. I was like, well, how long was uh labor? You know, I don't, I don't know. I should have, I should have planned this, should have planned this better. Uh, where did you meet? You know, they met at this place called Casa Loma Ballroom. This old, like, big band type place in, in the city. And then I had people, including a therapist, saying, well, you met her, that's enough. What more do you want? And I think it was kind of the hubris of me and youth. I was like, yeah, that's enough. I'd never had family. And I thought, what am I doing? I don't need family. You know, I can fast forward to, I'd say, January of 2016 after we're here in Germany and surrounded by my wife's family and I'm struggling, you know, and I'm really plugged into adoptee groups and I'm seeing people in their 60s and 70s posting, you know, I'm I'm 65 and I've been in quicksand. I think they use that word quicksand. That may have been where I got it from. I've been in quicksand my whole life, you know. I've been in fog. I, I have trouble finishing things. and. And I, I'll be honest, I didn't know if I was going to make it at that time because I thought if life keeps going on like this, you know, sporadic successes, being told, you know, you're you're good, and then, but still, this, you know, you can't latch onto life. In June of 2016, Mike flew back to his hometown to see his birth mother again for their reconnection. She was about 80 years old, and since that first face-to-face -face encounter. When the delivery guy, who looked like a man she'd met in a ballroom decades before, appeared at her door, she had grown nervous about seeing her birth son again. Virginia, the private investigator, told Mike there was some bad news. His birth mother did not want to see him. Virginia was trying to convince the woman to meet her son again. When Mike's plane landed, There, sitting in the airport, was my mom. My mom wanted to go to an olive garden which I don't think I'd ever been to. She'd really wanted to go. And so we went there. And so that's how the trip started at an olive garden and Virginia just sitting there smiling. She'd been through this many times with adoptees. That was her focus of her detective work was adoptees. I was there for two weeks. I met her cousins, the kids of some of her cousins. And I, you know, I sat with my mom and I talked to her. And we, we really look like each other. I have photos that show us even people like people who worked in her senior home were like, I had no idea she had a kid, you know, mm. and like, my God, you look just like her. What was it like to sit there with this woman who's telling you how much you looked like your biological father and to finally be with a woman who seems to have some level of caring for you, converse to what you experienced growing up? Like, what was it like? to just be in the presence of the person you came from and have them show a little bit of caring? All I could think was, this woman is so tiny. 
I was inside this woman at one point, uh, you know, just the biology of, of birth as this adoptee, I won't say for all adoptees, just, I don't get it. I didn't grow up with it. You know, anything to do with bodies. I, I just, what? I don't get it. So sitting there with her was like, wow, we're connected in this, this weird way. Tenuous is always the word for me because I want information. I don't want to push too hard, you know. But then if I don't push to the push hard enough, you may not get another chance. You know, I felt like if I leave without getting information, I don't know if she's going to want to see me again. I hear you 100 percent. It's so challenging to know how how hard to push. It's so hard to predict whether there's going to be another opportunity. And you kind of feel like you want to cram it all into one thing but you know that you can't do that because that creates so much pressure on that moment. Over the two week period, Mike sat with his birth mother for hours at a time. He was always gauging what to ask about and when was the right time. As she sat watching reruns of old TV shows, Mike would drop a question like, tell me about your father. Then his birth mother would talk for a little while, then go back to watching her show. He, he took things slow trying to consider the weight of his presence, their connection, and empathizing with what his birth mother's short experience with him had been like. Because I'm cognizant, you know, she told me, you know, she wanted to keep me. Her mom made her give me up. And so I know this is, this could at some point bring up pain for her, if not in this moment. So I'm very aware of this. So it is her needs and my needs and the balancing act. That's right. Yeah. It's hard to know who's really should come first, you know, and, and at which times they can, you, you, it's not always going to be the same. You know, sometimes your needs no. are going to be paramount and other times hers should be first and foremost. And, and it alternates, right? Yeah, and, I don't, and I don't live in this town. You know, I don't live in St. Louis, so right. I know I'm leaving. And when will I be, when will I be back here? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Am I going to come back twice a year? Probably not. Yeah, that is another good point. Another really good point. Wow. So I just I want to go back for a second because I feel like it, it didn't get enough attention. You actually decided to knock on her door. You're the second person that I've heard say that they created a ruse, created a reason to knock on the door. I'm a delivery person. I'm here to buy your house was the other one that comes to mind. I mean, <laughs> it's so crazy that that you decided to do this. At any point, did you think to yourself, "This is this is stupid. I shouldn't do this," or she's going to see right through? Like, I can't even imagine that you thought at all. She's definitely going to know it's me. I would imagine you would have thought she's never going to think it's me, and I'm perfectly safe. Mm, I don't know what my plan was. I mean, in retrospect, I realized. You know, I could have just, I mean, I'm going all the way down there. I could have just knocked and said who I was, you know? Yeah. But I think it's still the tenuousness. It's like, I can't be too direct about this, you know? Mm -hmm. This is all very fragile. And I was, I didn't know what her mom was going to do. I, I really, it seemed like her mom had her under her thumb. And I just thought, if I could just get this door open somehow. And I just was in normal clothes with a clipboard. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's, sometimes I think, I, I, you know, it's very sad. Virginia died a year, about a year ago. And it was, I felt like I grieved that more than I've grieved anything. You know, we really became close, my detective. Really? Okay. When we would visit St. Louis, we would stay at her house. And we'd stay up late talking. She set me up with somebody and a, a mother, a birth mother she knew, who took me down to the the home. I don't know what, what it's called. I mean, back then it was called the home for wayward girls or wayward women or something. And this is where they took my mom and where I was, you know, when she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so Virginia, the detective's introduced me to a birth mother who wanted who wanted to take me down there. So I went down to this home with this woman and walked around this home. Not a 
it's something else now. It's part of a university, I think. Mm -hmm. And that was heavy, knowing I was there. And even the woman I was with started crying. And she was there the same time as my mom. They may have known each other. Oh, that's really crazy. Wow. Why do you think Virginia connected you with this woman? You know, this woman really wanted to meet me. And I don't remember why. Maybe Virginia spoke highly of me or, or something. Or I don't know. This woman really wanted to take me to this home. Maybe she thought it would be, be helpful to me. I think it was. I can't imagine now not having seen it. Well, that's good to know. There's something cathartic that brings closure to going back to places that you knew you once were that you didn't know you had been there, right? As an adoptee, Isn't you don't weird? have yeah. this, this accurate history and narrative of how your life unfolded. So, for example, with my own son, he's 14 years old, and I could recount almost every day of his life, either through photos or stories. I know everything about him because he was with me and I was with him, and and that is what it's how it's supposed to be. But for an adoptee, you know, like yourself or myself, when you're adopted as an infant, you have none of those stories of, well, you know, I remember the night before my water broke and then we rushed to the hospital and did it like, and then you don't have any of those stories of coming home from the hospital and all that stuff. There's this wide piece of history that is lost until, in your case, you're able to discover it. And so when you do discover it, it's it's almost like it's like the logo for the show. This puzzle piece is finally put in place, right? And mm -hmm. and, it, and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it contributes to making you whole as as emotionally charged as it might be. Yeah, I mean, it's a part of my memory that feels like it's not like a new memory. It's it's like it's there. It was there, and now I see it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I feel that it is. It was right before Christmas in 1995 when Mike originally found his birth mother. After his maternal uncle didn't want to get to know him, Mike started searching for his biological father. At his temp job, Mike started his online search and thought he found a man who fit what he thought he knew of his birth father. Mike sent the man and all of his nine living children letters. No one answered. Mike assumed this was a rejection and put the whole experience behind him but he still wondered who his birth father was. After he reconnected with his birth mother again in 2016, he told himself he was content finding her and it would have to be enough. But that feeling only lasted a few short months. The idea just kept bouncing around in his head. Who was his birth father? If I could just get his name, a couple photos, a little family history, that's all I want, that's all I want. Mike had submitted a sample to Ancestry DNA, so he was getting the classic fifth and sixth cousin matches that rarely turn out to be any real help in the search. In the spring of 2018, Mike connects with a search angel in a Facebook group, and they start tag-teaming his search. She asks if she can log into his Ancestry account to poke around, so he agrees. But first, he needed to log in again for himself. It had been a year or so since he was on the platform. When I log in and I see there's somebody that says close match and it says from close relative to cousin, something like that. And I think all I read was cousin. I didn't see the close part. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, my God, I have a cousin. I was ecstatic. I messaged the search angel on Facebook. I say, hey, I think I have a first cousin. And she says, well, I hope you're sitting down. I think that's your sister. And I remember it like it was two hours ago. And I thought, Wh a what? And then she said, let me get back to you. She does something else. She, she finds a death record that shows my dad and listed as a, as a child is this woman I'm connecting with on Ancestry. So I originally messaged her and said, hey, I think we're cousins. And then I talked to the search angel and then I messaged her again. I said, I think we might be siblings, you know, and she's was shocked, but she was receptive. I sent her photos of me now and as a child and as a teenager. And everyone says I'm a twin of our dad. 
Wow. More than anybody, more than anybody, more than my half brother, I look exactly like our dad. And I thought, I can't believe it. You know, in this moment, I thought the relief of, I swear to God, I thought, oh, thank God. I will never have to wonder my dad's name again. Mike's sister sent him old photos and all of the family tree started to come together. Every year, his sister had some work in Rome, Italy. So since there were no plans for Mike to get back to get back to St. Louis, Missouri, he suggested they meet in Rome during her next trip. Coincidentally, his new sister was just about to propose the same plan. And so that's where we met. We met in Rome. Wow. I love this movie, La Dolce Vita. I don't know if you've seen it. And the lead actor wore a white silk suit. And I had one of those. And I said, I'm going to Rome. This is a big deal. I'm going to wear my white silk suit. And so for three days, I wore this white silk suit. Wow. Walking around Rome, meeting my sister. I didn't hang out with her three days. You know, we went to lunch. And I'd say we hung out five hours. And then I didn't see her for, I'd say, a year and a half. And then I... I met her and our brother and all the spouses and kids in St. Louis. And that was the last time I was in this. That, that was October of 19. Gotcha. Pre-pandemic. Wow. I was ecstatic to get an email from my brother leading up to it where he said, I am thrilled to finally get to meet you. I said, wow. That's all right. So cool. What was it like returning to St. Louis to meet these people that you you had no idea where they were or who they were, and now you're back in St. Louis, the scene of so much trauma and drama and challenge in your earlier life, but now you're back there for something hopefully more positive. What was it like to just return to this same city that you had fought so hard to get away from, but now you're fighting back to meet some new people? Well, it was then that I realized, oh, you see what you did here. You you equated the city with the family. <laughs> I somehow put it together. I was like, oh, St. Louis is not horrible. It's just, you know, it, it's all you knew was, you know, being in this family so warped my perception. I just thought I got to get away from everything. So it was nice to think, oh, this is kind of warm and cozy. You know, this is unusual. I would never have equated that with St. Louis, but I did not see my mom on that trip because she, as is persisted to this day, she she just doesn't want to meet and she doesn't want to talk on the phone. Your birth. But, but it was such a great trip, you know, hanging out with my brother one on one, two meetings with the extended family. I'm still, you know, their mom doesn't know about me. We don't share a mom. So mm -hmm. their mom does not know. So at first I was a secret. I had to, I had to push to meet my uncle. You know, at first they didn't want to let me meet my uncle. I had to be a little hard, you know, and risk losing them. I said, well, I have his info. So, <laughs> you know, I don't want to just contact him. I thought I would check with you first. And that was good. I called my uncle and we talked a couple hours and talked to his wife. And I might see him this spring. I've never met him. Oh, that's really cool. But our dad has been deceased for 20 years, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. You didn't get the chance to meet him. But it must be so rewarding is not the right word, but just comforting to know how much you looked like him, right? You're, I mean, for all intents and purposes, you're this outside child, yet you look the most like him. Unbelievably comforting. Like I say, I mean, solidifying. I felt, wow, I am solid. You know, I'm actually here. I'm not a ghost. And that is only persisted. You know, that's only grown, I should say. I have all these photos of him on my wall in my office, you know, because I need to see them. I need to see them every day because I can easily forget, you know. I don't have roots in me, you know, I, it's kind of like I have to impose roots from the outside. So I have to visually remind myself, oh, yeah, I have roots. I look like people. Yeah, I, I hadn't really thought of that before, but you're right. There's a element of reunion that can sometimes mean that you have to remind yourself that you're now part of this other group that you didn't know before. Right. And it's almost like yeah. you have to 
sort of remind yourself of this reality that didn't exist previously. Yeah. It's not something you grew up with, so it's not inherent to your thinking. You have to revisit it periodically to solidify it in your mind. So I could see how those visual cues of your father's picture on the wall are sort of a validation, right? This wasn't a dream. I didn't just... I didn't make this up in my mind. No. I'm truly part of that man and the family that is associated with him, etc. That's really, really cool. Yeah. Mike has been through a lot growing up in the family that he did, traversing the United States, landing in Germany, all the while searching for himself. I was really interested to hear how Mike is doing now that the quicksand is gone. Is he feeling grounded? I was curious how he was feeling these days. Usually good, but I, I think I'm finally to the point where I understand that I have to work hard to be okay. You know, I tend toward depression, and my depression gets extreme where just like just a couple of days ago, just like waking up thinking, oh, there's no point to any of this. Mm. You know, why, why keep this going? I mean, who would mind if I were not here, you know? Mm. But that's a lot less sporadic and I don't live in it and I don't I don't mitigate it with you know unsober behaviors I don't have girlfriend after girlfriend we've been we've been together 16 years which is another miracle he's very patient I do kickboxing you know <laughs> I have to get physical you know and this is really hard for me because with, I had to not be in my body growing up I was completely dissociated and we could not be loud and we could not make noise and so for me to do kickboxing and I just started taking a zumba class so it was like a latin dancing workout thing like I have to be physical and I always thought I was this cerebral academic and I don't think so you know, it doesn't seem to be me. And it's interesting to get to this age and still be like, still having these discoveries. I think I'm doing okay. You know, money making has always been a challenge. And as a guy, especially, I feel like that's a source of shame. You know, I do feel, and especially seeing, you know, my, my mother constantly shaming my father about not making enough money. You know, it, it is really, it's hard. I mean, it's just, it's another layer to the difficulty. I did some coaching and this might be a new avenue. And I realized in doing this job, I mean, I've started teaching. I've always been a good storyteller. So I, I, people said I used to teach storytelling. So I teach storytelling now, which is great. And I get good, good feedback about that. Really good feedback. People say it's like therapy. I'm very empathetic. You know, I take them and, unusual directions. But I did a coaching job, a sober coaching job for someone in the last year, the last six months, big name entertainer. And I thought, I look at this, every bit of misery I've got, I'm using to help this guy. You know, this guy's having trouble with the love addiction, you know, and I'm helping him. I'm coaching this guy and, and it paid pretty well on top of it. And I'm, get, I'm getting certified to do that kind of work. And so I look at it as like an alchemy of just like all this misery. Maybe something good is coming out of this. I love that. And I hope it's true. You know, it's important that it does. When we when you wallow in the challenges you've been through, you you tend to stay stuck in them and the quicksand would consume you. But you sound like a bit of a fighter, like you've fought your way to get out of that home. You fought your way to get out of St. Louis. You, you know, have been creative and somewhat forceful, you know, in trying to locate people, trying to connect with them, be it your uncle or your biological mother, what have you. Like, I admire the fact that you are pushing forward against a history of adversity that is really powerful and i think you should hold on to that yeah thank you it does seem like fighting against annihilation honestly it often feels like that is like i will not go down you know mm -hmm. i love that really good 
Mike, it's been incredible to hear your story. Like I said, I'm just, I'm in admiration of all that you fought through to get to where you are now. And, and I just want to wish you continued success. And I appreciate you sort of taking time to open up. It's not a lot of guys who will open up to some of the challenges we've been through, the emotions that we're facing. And, and I think it's really important that the men among us, especially in the adoptee community, do that more and more. So thanks for, for being brave and stepping up to do that for the rest of us. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I do see, I hear women sharing on podcasts. Oh, I'm crying now. And I think, Oh my God, as a guy, I can't say that. I mean, I can, and I wish I could ease into that. You know what I mean? But I feel the guardedness of being a guy in recovery. It's an extra challenge. I find, I don't know if you find that. It's true. I, I'm sensitive to what you're saying, but I've given up on trying to fight it. Listen, there was a time <laughs> when I first found my biological mother. When I told a story, I mean, I'm a, I guess I'm just sort of an emotional kind of person, but I would cry every single time I told the story. Every time. It took me a year and a half <laughs> to not cry and well up when I told the story. And I guess yeah. maybe it's because I learned to give the elevator version of it, like here's the the 60 second yeah. synopsis of what yeah. happened. So that allowed me to withdraw some of the emotions. Not everybody needed me to dump it all out on the floor. Mm. Um, but even more recently, yeah. I've been on a couple of other podcasts and I've told the story in its entirety. And it's the first time I'm sitting down in years and telling anyone the full story. And it brings tears to my eyes again. And I gave up trying to fight it. Like this is how I feel, and 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 it's important for other people yeah. to see that you do have these emotions. And I just let go of trying to battle it because it's not accurate. It, you know, if I'm standing here trying to pretend like I'm this tough guy who doesn't have these emotions welling up in me, then it's it's false. It's not true. I am mm -hmm. emotional about this. This is a serious thing. This is my life, and. And this is how I feel about it. And it's crazy. And I and I don't mind letting people yeah. know. You know what I mean? I think we have the, the society puts a little bit of pressure on the bravado that men are expected to have. And it's unnecessary and it's unhealthy, you know, because we do feel stuff. Yeah. Your mom has placed you for adoption and you have lived a separate life for your entire time on this earth. That is an emotional thing. And there's nothing wrong with, mm -hmm. you know, letting it bring you to tears or, or screaming from the mountaintops how happy you are for how things have gone, whatever your thing is. I think it's okay for us to show mm -hmm. emotion and we need to, we need to sort of prop each other up to allow that space to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for, thanks for what you do. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. I think, I pray, I thank you so much for being here with me today, man. Take care. All the best. Okay. All right, man. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, it's me. I liked hearing where Mike is these days, fighting against annihilation and turning his misery into positivity for others. He's been through a lot, from a household where he felt like he had to close himself up, to striking out on his own and almost never looking back on St. Louis. I liked hearing that he surprised his birth mother at her door. She later said he looked just like his birth father and that he was able to sit with her for hours to pick bits of information out of her brain. It's too bad she doesn't want to connect with him anymore and he didn't actually get to meet his birth father. But it sounds like the familial connections he's made are filling some holes that are helping him rebuild himself, even at this stage of his life. I'm Damon Davis, and I hope you found something in Mike's journey that inspired you, validates your feelings about wanting to search, or motivates you to have the strength along your journey to learn. Who am I, really? If you would like to share your adoption journey and your attempt to connect with your biological family, please visit whoamireallypodcast.com slash share. You can follow the show at facebook.com slash really. If the show is meaningful to you, you can support me with a contribution to keep it going on patreon.com slash really. Please subscribe to Who Am I Really on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. It would mean so much to me if you took a moment to leave a five-star rating there. Those ratings can help others to find the podcast too. 
And you can check out the story of my adoption journey, Who Am I Really? An Adoptee Memoir on Amazon.com. I hope you'll add my story to your reading list.